Good afternoon. Warm welcome to everybody. Please can you sit down and uh, get ready? We have a very, very exciting um, talk this afternoon. Um, I'm Silvana Bercino. I chair the Ecosystem Processes and Dynamics um, Steering Group. And today I'm delighted to introduce our last keynote of the conference. Um, Francisco, or Cisco, Werner, is the director of the scientific programs and chief advisor of the US NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. Cisco's research has focused on the um, study on the ocean oceanic environment through numerical models of ocean circulation and marine ecosystems in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. He has uh, studied the effects of physical forcing on lower trophic levels and the subsequent effects of structure functions and abundance of commercially and ecologically important species. He also has contributed to the development and implementation of ocean forecasting systems. His past appointments include being the director of NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center, director and professor of Rutger University Institutes of Marine and Coastal Science, and as he also has served as a steering committee chair of the GLOBEC, Global Ocean Ecosystem Dynamics Program. He received his undergraduate degree in mathematics and PhD degree from the University of Washington. And this year I've been very lucky to actually have the opportunity to work with Cisco as panelists when we were both invited to the um, session in the UN. So without any further ado, I'll leave you with Cisco Werner. Please sit down, enjoy, and we will take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you, Silvana, for the uh, kind words. And, and also, I want to thank um, ICES and the SICOM for the um, invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. Um, the last time I, sp I spoke to you actually was uh, uh, giving you welcoming remarks um, at the uh, meeting in 2017 in Fort Lauderdale when you came to the United States. And so today I get to bookend the meeting and actually talk at the very end and, and have a little bit of chance to, to get a little bit into the, um, in, into the science side of things uh, and explore, explore some issues there. Um, the, uh, uh, when when uh, Simon, Simon Jennings from SciComm uh, contacted me, he said, you know, geez, we'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what physical biological linkages, uh, you know, what questions there are and, and, and what should we be thinking about. And it's a topic that, that it's, it's, it's near and dear to me, like, like Silvana said, you know, we've spent a lot of time with a lot of you in, in the room here working on this topic. And, 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 um, and before coming here, I, I also sent out an email to a whole bunch of you, some of you in the room, um, asking for some help, uh, you know, in terms of what, what, sh what, what should we bring up? And I say we because I, I wanted to just kind of reflect what the community thought about this. And, and I want to thank everybody. Everybody that I contacted responded. And so, again, um, a heartfelt thanks for that. Um, and if I, if I forget to bring something up or if I say something wrong, it's, it's my fault. But thank you for that. So I if you think about why our physical biological linkages are, are important, you know, it, 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 it you can think of three things immediately, you know, biological processes and, and and chemical reactions depend on temperature, they depend on nutrients, they depend on environmental signals, number one. Number two, there's hydrodynamic transport and it moves all these things around. And so all the constituents uh, that, 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 that depend on environmental uh, signals actually are affected by transport. And ultimately, the constituents themselves, you know, either buoyancy, either because they float or they sink or whether they have directed motion, if they have behavior, in turn affect you know what what that physical biological interaction is so it's it's kind of it, it, it's it's a very in, in, in inherently coupled system and as such it really it's hard to imagine any part of the ocean that 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 doesn't have this physical biological coupling so i can't do justice to the whole thing so i'm going to bias my, my talk a little bit uh, perhaps towards the upper part of the water column i'm going to miss a whole bunch of other things that are deeper in the water column and and, and the benthos, and there were a lot of good posters and talks this week uh, that, that I'm not going to be able to talk about. And I'm also going to partially bias it towards, you know, that area going from, from, from physics to fish to fisheries management and advice and, and, and that socioeconomic side of things. So that's, that's sort of as a backdrop. And so the, the I'll, talk, uh, I'll offer some opening thoughts, uh, a brief historical um, overview of where, you know, how, how at least uh, I started with the, together with a lot of you in the room. What are today's drivers? You know, are they different from what they were perhaps uh, 30 years ago? 
um, as well as you know emerging questions that I that I'd like to put out. You know, secular versus rapid rates of change. You know, the importance of our system models. You know, talk about movements, behaviors, and shifts. A lot of which Greta talked about in a really super talk yesterday. Some aspects about modeling, uh, modeling and other supporting technologies in terms of where are we going in the future, and then some broader considerations and, and concluding remarks. So real quick, um, uh, it's actually interesting. So this is, this is 2019. It was in 1989, so 30 years ago, was um, uh, you know, the first workshop, I think, on, on the Globec um, Ocean Ecosystem Dynamics Program. And that was sort of a, a landmark program that um, you know, asks a simple question, right? What, what, what will the impact of changes in our global environment be uh, on the population and communities of marine animals? And it, it in turn, it sought to, to identify the basic mechanisms uh, that determine the abundance and distributions of animals as well as the variability about a mean. So those are two very simple questions, but they're, they're pretty fundamental. And and, and the Globec program, and then subsequently the Inver program, you know, took on uh, a lot of the work. And, and also they identified very clearly that we needed to look at a number of different scales. And it, it, we looked at small scales at the level of turbulence and turbulence encounter rates, intermediate scales, which had to do with that coupling between the open ocean and the shelf and the cross shelf exchanges, um, which which are and continue, which were and continue to to vex us in terms of in terms of the challenges. And ultimately, at the larger scales, you know what is happening at the larger scales, and we, you know, we talk about, you know, Pacific decadal oscillations or AMOs and regime shifts and things like that. And still, back then, in terms of how how we advanced, and this is again to contrast for what I'm going to say, where you know, what are the driving issues, uh, you know, today? There were some very nice hypotheses that we needed to take on. And um, you know, if you all, if you if you start with the Huart's critical period hypothesis, there's a whole number of things that other other hypotheses that that perhaps stem from it. Um, you know, whether it's a match mismatch from David Cushing or the Men the Vagrant from Sinclair and Isles, turbulence encounter rates, Rothschild Osborne, et cetera. So there were some hypotheses that said, well, how do we explain the variability? So it was it was, it was it, all of which all of which had inherently this 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 aspect of, of of figuring out the scale interactions that result in, you know, the the, the that variability in, in 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 biology that we see in the ocean. And I'm going to show a slide that it could have been anywhere, you know, in terms of a, a number of projects that emerged from Globec, and I'm going to show you one from Georgia's Bank Globec, which is the one that I was most involved in, and, and again, several others here. The overall Globic, Georgia's Bank Globic program was, was led by Peter Wiebe, who's, who's somewhere here, but a whole bunch of us worked in that, and there were also programs in, in France and Germany and in, in South Africa and Canada, um, Spain, et cetera. But it's all summarized in one, and so it, 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 the, the, the idea here is that um, there's uh, three-dimensional circulation, um, there is, uh, sh in this case, it's a, it's a th the open ocean. In this case, let's say it's the Gulf of Maine. There's open ocean here, but there's a deeper basin to a to a shallow basin connection that isn't just flow, but it actually includes behavior. So this is this idea of the of the coupling between behavior and, and physics that we talked about. That biology, in this case, the the, the copepods, you know, would in, in turn, you know, uh, reach the Georges Bank. Which then, you know, in turn had a, a small scale, small scale turbulence that, when you had uh, an individual based model that included all the things that I talked about, all the biological processes that depend on, you know, growth and and, and metabolism and and light and you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, when when coupled with behavior, result in in some kind of a retention of of, of the larvae on the bank that helps explain perhaps the variability of population on on Georgia's bank. And so this is. This is about 10 years and 500 people, you know, uh, in, in, in one slide or something like that. But it, but it does capture the, the sense of, of testing hypotheses that we were able to do in order to understand almost uh, sort of systematically how it is that, 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 the, um, that the variability in population, um, in this case cotton haddock, fueled again, you know, by secondary production um, happened on Georgia's bank. So that's a quick summary. And so the question is, so where are we now? Um, and I think that what's happened since then, um, you know, really is, is that the oceans um, are changing and they're changing a lot faster than we thought. By the way, the little, the little red arrow here is sort of the end of, of the Globec program, um, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the reason I put it here is, is how much 
how much the ocean has changed since then, you know, both in terms of temperature, um, PCO2, pH, et cetera. There's, it's really quite a different ocean if you think about it from, from when it was, you know, in this case about 20 years ago. And we also see that, and we're quite familiar with the fact that there's these marine heat waves um, that, that are appearing, you know, more frequently in more places that, again, are some things that, that, that were not things that we dealt with yet. They're, they're things that, that um, um, are very, very much uh, a, a reality today. So this picture, it's, it's a nice little cartoon um, about climate-ready fisheries. Uh, as I said, it's a little bit focused towards the fishery management side of things. But it nicely captures all of the things that, that you would think about that you'd need to know. You need to, you know, you, you ultimately in this case, you know, trying to understand variability in fisheries, uh, and there, do you detect the changes that might cause that. Um, you might understand the changes, and that red arrow there basically is what we did in the previous um, efforts, you know, of, un of detecting changes and explaining it. What I don't think we did as well was the three ovals in yellow, which is which is evaluate the risks and 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 priorities, um, you know, uh, uh, assess and forecast. We we did a little bit of it, but not as much as as perhaps we we, we should or the, or as we need these days, and also communicating advice. So that the science and advice was a little bit disconnected, um, and and my program manager kept kept hitting me upside the head with that. You know, why aren't you? When are you going to tell us what this means, uh, Cisco? But anyway. So that's, that's, it captures, I think, where we're going, we're, what we did well, and, and where are we going to go next. So the first question there that's not checked is, is how will it change? And, and I'm going to use an example that probably several of you, um, I've given, uh, you know, I've presented part of this uh, elsewhere, and it's, and it's going to be on, 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 the, um, on, on what we refer to as the 2013-16 um, uh, North Pacific Climate Change Stress Test. Um, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's the blob, so I'll talk a little bit about the blob. Um, and, and not only is, am I going to talk about the stress test, but I'm also going to ask the question, did we pass the stress test? You know, did, we actually, did we actually make it? And it's a, it's a, it's a remarkable thing that happened um, as, you know, during that time period. <coughs> and, and very quickly, and I think, again, many of you have seen these uh, pictures like this. Uh, so you have a picture of the, of the North Pacific. Um, uh, here's the, uh, the, the Bering Sea, so here's uh, the U.S. West Coast, British Columbia, Alaska, and so on. And, and these temperatures, um, you know, if you look at a time series between 1900 and 2015, so about 115 years or so, you see that, the, that in the Gulf of Alaska, the, the sea surface temperature anomalies were almost three to four times the, st the standard deviation of, of the mean of, of that time series. And, and it wasn't just a surface trap sea surface temperature. If you look at the depth here, this goes from the surface down to 500 meters, you know, easily that signal made it down to two to 300 meters. It was a whopping amount of energy that, and temperature that made it in there. And, and the reason is, is uh, you know, a reason is very simple. It's that, um, you know, if you look at, at, the, at, the, at the Gulf of Alaska, normally you have the Alaska high during the summers and that alternates between high and the Aleutian low. And, in the winter, when there's storms, during the high, it's you know you get you get you, you, know, you get you get the sunlight and the heating. Then when your Lucian low comes in, then you get the storms and the mixing. So between the two, it kind of evens out. And and for the pat for the for those three for that time period, basically that that high just parked itself there. So there were never there was never really the alternate to the high. There was no low alternating with a high. So you just had all this energy and all this temperature um, accumulating there. And so the stress test and and um, we call it a stress test because, you know, the, the, as, I, as I say, you know, it, 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 the, the, the temperature uh, departures from the anomalies and so on are not that different necessarily from what is being projected, you know, might be the, the, the temperature changes and, and such in, in the, um, um, you know, by, by, the, by, the, by the climate change uh, uh, models. And, and it's a stress test because, you know, if you think back at the, um, you know, 2008 and 9 when there was the, um, the, the global financial crisis, the banks did stress tests as well. They said, what happens if interest rates go up, you know, 10%? What happens if employment does that? What happens if the price of oil does that? And how does that affect, you know, the financial systems? And in this case, the stress test was, you know, what happens, you know, when we, when we change the temperature by so much? What happens when stratification changes by so much? What happens when the resulting by geochemistry changes by, by a given amount. And so we, we were able to see for three years, witness what, what was there. <coughs> and as you expect, you know, there's, there's, the, there's, a, there's a larger, say, basin scale change that then locally affects, you know, temperature, 
sea ice, uh, in this case also, um, you know, the snowpack on, on, the, on, the, on the mountains that, that affect in turn the salmon, um, you know, the amount of freshwater discharge, productivity, et cetera. So there's a cascade of things that ultimately, um, you know, also affects, you know, social, social impacts. And so the, the story here is, is, is quite complicated and, and allows us to look at, you know, just, just what would happen uh, under, these, under this scenario. And, and what we observed, um, and this picture is just a composite of some things, we observed anomalies in a matter of, you know, a year or two that, that we hadn't seen before or, or even more quickly than that. And, and so the, the picture on, on the left is, is uh, this is off San Diego, La Jolla, and, and we saw false killer whales that we hadn't seen there in, in over 20 years. Uh, these are bluefin tuna. These are juveniles, 100 to 200 pound uh, juvenile uh, bluefins that are normally not there as well. They hadn't been seen in over 80 years. Um, over this distance between, you know, basically uh, uh, just south of uh, San Francisco to, to Los Angeles, a survey that covered this area in about a two-week period, you know, you had a hall that was entirely these, um, these red uh, pelagic crabs, another one that was entirely, you know, salps, another one that was entirely... Uh, rockfish and and so the diversity that was there um, as, as as pointed out here was one where if you do a, a diversity plot or, or, a, or a species richness was was the highest uh, in, in the previous uh, 20, 20 some odd years irrespective of El Nino's La Nina's and all of that stuff so it was just a real jolt to the system in terms of what was there and and also this picture here uh, these are two different kind of copepods these are several different kinds of copepods lipid rich copepods and lipid poor copepods and there was a poster out there that said something about, you know, if your advisor tells you that copepods don't matter, don't believe them or something like that. In this case, I'm going to say that copepods do matter. And I'll come back to the story about why these matter. But there was a switch between lipid-rich and, and lipid-poor copepods as well. And um, in addition to that, at lower endo endotrophic level, if you will, there was, there was a huge um, uh, algal bloom, uh, in this case the pseudonitra bloom, uh, that actually went, you know, from Southern California. Eventually, it extended all the way to um, uh, to to, um, to Alaska. That caused uh, uh, unusual mortality events of whales. Um, it caused closures in in um, uh, in the blue and the and the sorry the Dungeness crab fishery. And in turn, when the fishery returned, um, there was also a shift in the whale migration patterns that then caused interactions between. The, um, the crab fishery and, and the whale. So it was the cascade of things that happened, um, again, starting with this physical event that then, you know, that then, uh, you know, rippled through the system was, was, was really remarkable. Um, and, and this slide is busy, but I'm going to walk you through it because it's important. It's important that, and this is the part about going from physics all the way to understanding, uh, you know, the impact on the ecosystem all the way to understanding the impact on, on, the, on the social and the socioeconomic aspect of, 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 of the systems that, that we look at. So, you know, the timeline is here, you know, the blob starts, uh, you know, the record high temperatures are here, there's the, the, the loss of snowpack, you know, that, was, that also happened in the Sierras. Uh, the impact on the ecosystems, you know, I, you know, there's a loss of eggs because of the temperature in the rivers was so high that the, that the salmon eggs, uh, you know, basically 95% loss of some, some salmon um, uh, eggs. Uh, the Fraser River sockeye changed their migration route rather than coming the normal way. They avoided uh, the temperature. Uh, this, this domoic acid resulted in, 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 um, in, in a, an unusual mortality event. Um, and as I said, the, uh, the humpback whales shifted their, the distribution, ultimately interacting with, with, the, um, with, the, with the, uh, the fishery of the, of the Dungeness crab. And in terms of the fishery impacts, there was a whole host of disasters declared uh, that had to do with uh, disasters to, uh, you know, Indian nations. Uh, uh, it had to do with disasters of the crab fishery. It had to do with disasters of, uh, you know, um, other, other uh, salmon and, and um, the Red Sea urchin and, and other fisheries. So this was something that happened that, um, you know, all started, you know, from a, a, a physical forcing that, 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 that went through uh, and, and rippled through it. So couple of, a couple of thoughts before going on. So, and I, I, I'm not claiming that this is unique. So, so the first point I wanted to make is that these ecosystem-wide conditions um, that we saw, and I said, insert your own observation here, you know, again, Brett and others talked about, you know, impacts that, that were off Australia and other places are really unprecedented. The kind of things that we're seeing, and it's, you know, it's, these are not just one-offs. They're happening over and over. 
uh, and they gave us an opportunity to look I either into recurrent conditions or a new baseline. Uh, you know, you could think of it either way. We have to be quicker in terms of, uh, you know, anticipating these things and reacting, and we have to communicate this to the decision managers. And this theme about, you know, seeing, predicting, reacting, and, and working with, with the decision makers is, is what I think is going to be really different in terms of what do we need to do about, what do we need to know about physical biological interactions, and, and how do we go forward with it. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about is this issue about differences in, in secular versus, um, versus rapid rates of change. And, and, and the idea is not new. As a matter of fact, there's a book by Mike Mullen you know, from the mid-90s or something where he talks about differences in scales and interactions uh, and the variability in those different uh, processes. And in this, the idea is very simple. Um, so you have long-term climate variability, you know, sort of a slow modulated response, and that could be ENSOs or PDOs or, or AMOs or NAOs, whichever you wish. You have short-term variability, uh, you know, more weather-like, et cetera, but, but, but could be there. Um, and then you have also the, the underlying secular change. And, and, and the idea is that if you add all three of those, then, you know, the, the combination of the, of the green, the red, and the blue eventually gets you something that, well, you know, every so often you would hit one of these extreme events or something, but now you're just hitting them more frequently, right? It's, it's just because, you know, again, that, that underlying shift has, has, has taken place. And if you look at a retrospective analysis of marine heat waves in the North Pacific from 82 until now, you know, some of these might, might be, the big ones here might be El Nino's when there was some, so but in, since 14 forward, there's, a, there's just been a, a whole, you know, more, a whole many more of these uh, taking place that, that, that again, are, are affecting what, what we look at. So that's one, you know, how rapidly things are changing and how frequently. I think this is something that we need to, we need to be, uh, you know, aware of. Uh, second one is, is, you know, the underlying biogeochemistry, if you will. And, and um, this is something that, uh, you know, this is working towards Earth system models. These are these models that couple, you know, the land, atmosphere, ocean, and then when you begin to include actually the biogeochemistry, you, get, you begin to get into, into being able to make ecologically revel relevant statements with these Earth system models. And, and this is a question, or this is a paper that appeared recently by, by uh, Park and, and Charlie Stock and John Dunn and others at, at GFDL in, 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 in Princeton, uh, where they, they said, well, how good are these models? How, how, how far into the future can we forecast these models in terms of the biogeochemistry, the underlying biogeochemistry of this, in this case expressed in terms of uh, chlorophyll. And what they found was that um, they, they can do a pretty good job at the global scale of maybe one to three months in advance. That's, that's basically the skill that they, that they are able to, to, to say that they had. But it varies regionally. So if you look at, you know, globally this is what they got, but if you look at how, how well these, these, these do in the North Atlantic versus North Pacific, there's, there's differences in terms of how well we can capture, um, again, the underlying biogeochemistry and the underlying, you know, forcing, if you will, that will give us these, these signals. And, and the way to read these plots is that if you start the model in January is that, you know, you, you, the, 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 d the darker the red, the better your prediction or your b the better your skill. And so you do well until you get to the next winter, and then in winter you don't do well. The winter forecasts are generally not very well. Um, and so th these bands represent areas where you can do well in the forecast, and these are usually by the time you get into the winter months, and winter chlorophyll is just hard to, to, to predict. If you go into the North Pacific, it's much more spotty, and that might be because you know there might be differences associated with atmospheric iron deposition or other things. So it's, it's different depending on, on where you go. But it's in terms of the challenge, you know, incorporating the, the, the chemical and biological data into forecasts remains really one of, the, one of the hardest challenges that are out there in terms of ocean biogeochemistry. Um, so that's another one. Another one is changes in food web structures and interactions. And I'm going to focus first, st stay on the, on the right-hand side here. And, and this is one of these plots that we've, I think we've all seen, we've all talked about the sardine anchovy fluctuations and, and a lot of work by Francisco Chavez and, and others, you know, some really, really nice work, you know, was able to, you know, to relate it to, to, to difference in cold and warm phases. And, and uh, you know, it, it, uh, after a lot of work, you know, some of the things that emerged was that, well, um, anchovies are associated with cold phases and, and sardine are associated with warm phases. And, and there's a nice, um, you know, uh, hypothesis there to, to work with. Um, but I, I'm going to now 
take a, a, a closer look at something at a time series, a Kalkaki time series, which is a time series of about uh, 70 years long in off, off San Diego again, um, for sardines. I mean, I'm sorry, for anchovy. And what you see here is a 70-year time series um, of, of, of larval, sard uh, larval anchovy. And, you know, starting in the 1950s, you get your ups and downs. And then it was basically flat. I mean, there was like basically zero spawning stock biomass. It was just, it was just um, uh, you know, there were, you couldn't find an anchovy to save your life. And then all of a sudden in 2014 or so, you begin to see some recruitment. Now remember, this is the warm phase. This is the time of the warm blob and all of that. And, and recently, the numbers appear to show that they're higher than at any point in time in the entire Kalkaki time series which is exactly the opposite of what we were thinking in terms of the, again, the nice way of framing it in terms of warm and cold phases. So we're having anchovies during a warm phase, we're having through the roof anchovies in a warm phase when it sh that's not what we expect. And so this is work um, that um, uh, Rasmus uh, Swellthorpe and Andrew Thompson are doing uh, from Scripps and from the Southwest Center. Um, and what they're looking at is, is, is the food chain length within the larval anchovy um, uh, that, that, they, that they capture. And what they saw was, if you look at uh, times when the anchovy were, were more abundant, as indicated by the gray areas here, the food chain length was, uh, was shorter. If you look at it when the anchovy had declined, it was basically the food chain length was longer. I guess you could think about maybe trophic efficiency or something like that. And, and 2019 isn't plotted here, but that number would be up here. The point is that they're, they're now get beginning to look and trying to see if the food chain length or something about the, that underlying um, you know, uh, prey field actually has something to do more than just a simple warm cold or something like that. And what they're going to be doing is environmental DNA, eDNA-based characterization of predators and preys in this time series to try to see if we can get a better understanding of recruitment fluctuations. And it's really interesting because I said, you know, there was, there was practically no anchovy. So this, uh, again, talks about the importance of larval survival. Those early ideas that, that, that we looked at a long time ago about larval survival, you know, dictating the, the, the strength in, 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 or the recruitment of the larvae dictating the strength in population. So these are we're beginning to think about, well, maybe there's something else going on that, that now with new techniques, and I'm introducing here the idea that there's new techniques coming in that allow us to look at things that we weren't able to do before. And in terms of movement, um, again, uh, Greta, Greta uh, spoke to this yesterday. Um, I'm going to start on the right uh, with the uh, black sea bass, and this is work from the Northeast Center, John Hare and others, uh, where you know the, the idea here is as simple as that. You know, the black sea bass. This is uh, Cape Hatteras and Cape Cod. Uh, over a time period of maybe you know 40 years or so, 50 years or so, there's been a slow uh, migration to the north, consistent with some of the geographic or biogeographic shifts that we've talked about or that we talked about yesterday. It brings in interesting things in um, terms of understanding why this happens and the management of these things as they cross, in, in our case in the United States, across jurisdictions within uh, U.S. Uh, boundary lines. But this is sort of on a 40 to 50 year time scale or something, at least, you know, the, 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 the image shown here. This one is going back into Alaska again. Um, here's Alaska, here's the Aleutians. Uh, the Aleutians go out here. Uh, the Bering Sea is out here and, 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 and Bering Straits up that way. Um, and, and what this shows is Pollock and the, the distribution in this case of, of temperature um, and, and the shifts in temperature that, that you know, what, what they were, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, under normal conditions and then under the, the warming conditions, the North Atlantic, uh, or the, sorry, the North Pacific warming. And what you see is, is, is that the blue areas here, which is where the, the catch was, has shifted pretty quickly. It's not a matter of, you know, a decade or two. It's a matter of a year or two, and all of a sudden you've had a complete shift in the population. Uh, the relevance of this is where should we have the surveys? How do we design surveys under such rapid change? Um, you know, how do we incorporate this into the assessments? Uh, and this is actually a, 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 this is one of these areas where the coupling between uh, you know, understanding the physics, understanding how the physics affect the distribution, and then understanding how we manage the species based on this thing all, all come together. So this is, again, the point here is how quickly things are changing relative to what perhaps we thought things were changing. So how will we get there? Uh, so I, I pointed out some things here in terms of things that we think about, and I'll talk a little bit about data and a little bit about modeling. And so we've, there, were, there were a couple of sessions at the meeting here on, on machine learning and artificial intelligence, which were really good. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about here. And, and the idea that 
that you know, you know, these new techniques that are coming in, the new capacities, you know, open up a new way of looking at things. And, and we've all seen these images, and they've been around for a long time, but I think they're finally happening. So you know, the fact that we, we have all of these instruments measuring all over the place all the time, measuring different things is, is something that, that does allow us to, 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 to look at, at, at processes at different scales and, 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 and synopticity that, that we weren't able to do before. And, uh, you know, this is a, 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 s a slide I, I stole from Wu Jun Lee from, from the Applied Physics Lab, um, where, you know, the, the conversation was how perhaps the way that we looked at science has changed, right? It, it, and, and on the left you say, well, it used to be that we, we would have, you know, some very nicely designed surveys and cruises and we'd calibrate everything, um, you know, and we'd ground truth everything and, and we would do the experiment and, and, and count it and spend time on it. And that was sort of hypothesis driven. I think I know what's going on and this is what I'm going to go measure. Now that's kind of shifting. It's kind of shifting to you have a whole bunch of stuff coming in, a whole bunch of information coming in. Some are on short time scales, long time scales. Sometimes you have limited calibration. You really can't do the kind of calibration or experimental design that you would have done, you know, you know how it was done on the left hand side. And so that little emoji there is when you get all this data, you know, your head kind of, you know, explodes in terms of trying to figure out how do you how do you do that? And so fortunately her head didn't explode, but anyway, so she's right there and, and sh she, 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 this is an example of a uh, mooring um, off, the, uh, off uh, Oregon, um, you know, at, at 200 meters depth and, and it's an echogram. And the, this came about because we, we were launching all of these gliders and all of these things in terms of, you know, measuring acoustically what's out there. But without the calibration, without a net coming behind it and saying what was the acoustic signal, it becomes a question about, well, wh what did you see? And so the question is, how, what can we do to get all of this data, some of which is, you know, coming in without necessarily knowing wh what it was, uh, to, to do something with it? And, and not only is it just one time series where you can say, well, yeah, I see, you know, I obviously see a day-night pattern and I see motion and so on. And you can do that maybe with, with one, um, uh, you know, mooring, but when you have a whole bunch of these coming in all the time, how do you do the ups, how do you scale all this up? How do you get all this data? And as I said, this was discussed very nicely in the, in the session, I think it was on Tuesday on machine learning of how do you, how do you deal with all of this, all of this information? And there's methods, again, either supervised or unsupervised machine learning, and there's decompositions, um, and then you can eventually come up with you know, something that says, well, maybe from all that data, something is gelatinous zooplankton, something is fish, and, and something is, well, I don't know. And so you, you, you begin to work with, you know, the, what, what you get out of this machine learning part and, 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 and the, the person who, who will work with it to try to make sense of it. And, and this is a quote, um, actually, Mark Dickicola sent me a, we, we talked about this in Halifax a couple of months ago, and he said, well, here's a, 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 an article that, that, um, that would be of interesting, and I, and I put it up there because, you know, I'm, I'm struggling about this issue between data-driven and, and hypothesis-driven science. It says, it's conceivable that a machine learning approach soon will enable us to make more accurate predictions about how a protein will fold. That article had to do with protein folding. You can put in here movement patterns. Uh, and this may be very useful to know, but it won't be scientific knowledge. After all, the computer knows nothing about biochemistry, or in this case, the computer knows nothing about biological oceanography. Anyway, this is a, a, a nice article to say, we're shifting how we're doing the science, but we still now what we have to do is is not just get totally go in one direction and saying that 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 data science, but actually embracing both and embr embracing both that hypothesis driven and the data driven science. But it is an important change in terms of how we look at things, and how perhaps even in graduate school we think about experimental design and so on. So there's a, a fundamental, probably different way of thinking. So how do we get there um, um, in models? I talked a little bit about data. So what about models? Um, and I'm going to put up here, you know, something that looks like a, a Rossby uh, diagram, uh, you know, with, with time on the x-axis and, and space and the, and the vertical axis. And <coughs> what, what you see is, uh, you know, on, on scales of, of days and weeks, you've got hurricanes and tropical storms, you've got flooding. You know, as you get time, then you have the mid-latitude, high-low pressure system. You get monsoons, longer time scales. You get ENSOs, PDOs, AMOs, global warming when you go out to the century scale. And, and also plotted here then is is the um, the the the, 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 uh, the processes or the the systems that you want to look at in terms of fishery. You get industry operations, aquaculture that, that's in, in here, fisheries monitoring and closure, annual catch limits, you know, fisheries rebuilding plans, resilience and stability. 
And so this, this kind of puts on a plot all the different processes that are out there as well as interests that we have in managing, whether it's harvesting, whether it's conserving, um, or, or, or other industrial um, uh, you know, efforts. And I'm going to be focusing on um, this, this time scale here, which is uh, subseasonal to seasonal to decadal. So I'm going to make a pitch that I know I've seen, I mean, you know, we've all seen these forward 100-year projections and, and things. And, 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 and I want to say that rather than focusing on those, those longer-term projections and all that, the, the really important part that we need to be looking at is that sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale, which is basically the three-month to three-year uh, time scale. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk about it briefly why. So you can think about various lengths of forecast, okay, in terms of how well do we do the physical forecast of the ocean and, and what does that impact. Uh, Near-term forecast, you might have something about, you know, bycatch avoidance. You know, you get something where, hey, there might be a, this might be a place where you have turtles, so you want to avoid that, or, 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 or you know, aquaculture uh, forecast. On, on the sub-seasonal to seasonal forecast, that goes in towards stock assessments and harvest levels and so on. Longer time scales, you begin to perhaps get into management strategy evaluations, and ultimately longer, longer still, then you, you, you begin to look at, at recovery plans and, and things. But I want to stay on the, um, on the sub-seasonal to seasonal, which is basically the blob, okay? And I'm going to come back, uh, coming back to this thing because this is, you know, basically what, what we saw, and, the f and, and we weren't able to forecast it. We, we, you know, we, it caught us off guard. We didn't know. So the question is, now that we went through it, you know, could we have predicted so that if it happens again, and it's not if it's happening again, it appears to be happening again, and this is a plot from, okay, this is 2013, this is 18, February 2019, August 2019. I, I was going to put up a quote from Abba saying, Mamma Mia, here we go again, but instead I, I put on this quote from uh, the San Francisco Chron Chronicle, which is basically the newspapers are on the alert, you know, trying to say, okay, something is happening, given the impact that, that this had. So it's, it's happening, We're, and, and, and this goes back to the, uh, you know, did we pass the stress test? Are we ready to forecast this one? Or, you know, how well do we know what, what, what's happening to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to say it's happening? And all those disasters that I talked about, you know, how much of those do we think you know, we can provide advice to or not. And this is a, a recent paper by, by Mike Jaycox, and, and, and the question is, and so he went back and sort of trying to hindcast it um, and, and with, with reanalyzing data and trying to see, you know, could the models, had they been ready to do this, uh, capture the, um, the blob? And the answer is part of it. So there were some things that could be captured, some things that couldn't be. Uh, so the answer is that um, it was more or less predictable uh, depending on the forcing mechanism, so depending on, you know, whether something was more due to wind versus pre-existing conditions and so on without getting into too much details. And so you can see that in some cases, um, you know, maybe, yes, there was some capture of, a, of, a, of a at least a tendency. In other cases, it completely missed it in terms of, you know, also when you initialize the model or not. So there's this still something that, that we need to look at, yet I would argue that being able to forecast these events, given that apparently it didn't just happen once, it's happening, it, it, it may be happening now, and yet we need to say something is something that, that, that we, should spend, we should spend time on. And the importance of this, bringing back again to the importance of the zooplankton that I talked about earlier and, and, and temperature, is, 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 is a short summary here about what happened to the Pacific cod. Um, and that little red arrow that you saw is it pointing to the, to the absolute lowest number in biomass that, that they had measured, um, you know, in, the, in this time series here of about, of about 30 years. Um, and, and, and the explanation to this, and this is where, you know, the physics ties in with the biology, ties in all the way to the, to the management advice, uh, and is that this is work by Steve Barbeau and, and Ann Hollowood and others up at the Alaska Center, is that this, th it appears to be that it was, it th several things came together in this case. Yes, the warming was there, you know, then, you know, th the Pacific cod had very high morta uh, uh, m mortality as a result of these warm temperatures, the higher metabolism in warmer waters, and the lower forage. And this is the part about the difference in, in, in the zooplankton that was, that was not there. The e either the right kind of zooplankton wasn't there or not the right amount of zooplankton to offset uh, this, this higher metabolism. And so the coupling between 
the, the forecasting of, of the biogeochemistry that then would give you the secondary production that then would give you, you know, coupling to, 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 to what you would might be able to forecast on, on, on the fishery side is, 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 is the important connections that we need to make here, again, to provide advance. And these are, this just shows here, you know, this, this skinny little uh, uh, pea cod there just shows that the, the Pacific cod that were captured were, were very, uh, in very low condition as a result of a, of a combination of these things. So, uh, you know, again, coupling all of this knowledge of physics and, and, and biology all the way to management advice, um, you know, we've been, uh, one of the things that, that Anne and, 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 and Kristen Holzman and Jimmy and Ellie and others are doing is, is considering this idea that, that I'm referring to as shadow assessments, which is you, you do your normal assessments, but then you do, you, you do a, another set of assessments where you include the environmental conditions explicitly. And in, and, and in this case, you know, as we know, you know, to have this become part of management advice takes a little bit of time because we all have to, uh, you know, perhaps get, get, a, get a good sense of, of, of how good this, 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 these estimates are. But, you know, here's just some examples of, of you know, the, the, uh, the, the, black, uh, the black dot is, is without the environmental considerations and the X is with environmental considerations. And again, this is something that 30 years ago we weren't doing. Maybe we didn't know this well enough. We stopped short of taking that step from understanding the physics and the physics drivers all the way to the, to the management side of things. And I think this is important, particularly when we talk in, you know, within ICs or within, you know, the, you know our fishery management uh, uh, structure in the United States and, and, and the assessments there is, is taking all of this knowledge that, that, that I think is pretty robust and how do we translate this in, in, into management. And so this kind of brings me back, I'm almost done. It brings me back into um, you know, where, where do we go next in terms of uh, bringing this knowledge into, 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 into action, so to speak. And, and, and we need to be more explicit, and, and I think I'm echoing something that was discussed in the panel on, on Monday morning about the communication of science advice into, into uh, you know, to society and the management. Um, so we need to be, you know, take these, these forecasts and, and actually begin to work with, with the managers and see how they would include it, working with them. Um, you know, develop a suite of hypotheses that would allow us to take this information and have what ifs, if you will. Working with the, um, um, you know, with industry and, and the people who depend on, on the advice that we provide, I think that it's important for us to, to co-produce and communicate the advice that, that, that results out of what I think is pretty solid science. Um, and, and, and actually also communicate the trade-offs and have that discussion. It not, should not be a one-way conversation, but a, but a joint conversation and joint engagement between the management side, the science side, and, and, and the constituencies, or the constituents. And also, you know, this idea of, 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 of climate-rated management actions, or at least, you know, scenario planning. Um, and and what, what I have up there in the first sentence says, you know, we need to plan for future scenarios um, not, not because if it happens, because we've know, we, we know it is going to happen, whatever it is. You can fill in it, whatever scenario you're looking at, but we know it is going to happen. And, and for, you know, for a long time, we always seem to be caught flat-footed when something happens. And I think that's something that we shouldn't accept anymore. I mean, I think we, we have enough understanding of the system uh, that, that, that we can have some scenario planning to make some decisions rather than saying, well, gee, I, I, I wasn't expecting it. And the planning can be through management strategy evaluations. You know, we could talk about emerging fisheries or, you know, discussions among, uh, you know, adjacent uh, jurisdictions. And so my, my final slide is, is that, um, you, know, you know, facetiously, what do we need to know? Uh, I think everything. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the simple answer. Um, you know, the examples I brought, you know, kind of illustrate how everything does come together at some point. But there are some things that are, that are evolving in this next 10 years. You know, we are evolving from, I think, you know, what would be probably more hypothesis-driven science to hypothesis and data-driven science. We have a wealth of data that's coming in that we need to take advantage of, uh, that we need to think about, that we need to, you know, embrace the difficulties and the challenges with it. But, but they do, they will tell us things that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. I, I, um, I, uh, I think back at, um, at a closing meeting of JGOFs, uh, when David Carl, um, you know, talked about, you know, what, what, what take-home messages he had from, from Jagoff's, and, and he said it was the surprises. And, and in particular, he pointed at, at, the, at identifying the role of nitrogen fixers um, in, 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 in the importance of, 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 the, of the, you know, the biochemistry of the North Pacific. 
uh, and it was something that emerged out of that time series, and it's something that they weren't necessarily looking at, but it did emerge from you know, the HOTS time series that, that he was able to look at. Then there's things that will emerge through this wealth of information that's out there. We just need to be clever about how we, how we look at that. The modeling, I think that I pointed out at some things, there is a very direct challenge at that sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. The three month to the three year window is, is almost a sweet spot um, you know, in terms of being able to predict that. If we can do that, then there's a lot of decisions that we, would, that we can make, or at least scenario planning that we can do that would affect our fishery management. Um, and the provision of advice. And then, you know, this discussion about uh, the interdisciplinarity that I talked about the an at the end, that, and it was also, again, talked about earlier in, in the week, that, that it's, it's, it's not science or stakeholders. It really is science and stakeholders. It's all of us together having, having this, this discussion here. It's, it's a much more, that's why I, I put the and in boldface there in terms of all of the things that we need to do that perhaps we had stopped just short of that other side of the end in, in previous approaches. And I put on the right-hand side of the bottom box uh, things that, that you know, did come up in, 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 in my conversations that I didn't have time to talk to, the importance of tipping points and thresholds, uh, adaptation to, threshold, to stressors that I didn't talk about. You know. And then there's, you know, I look at aquaculture, high latitudes, and the mesopelagic and, and deep sea. These are huge topics in and of themselves that I think they deserve a special attention. And so I didn't get into them, but I do want to mention it that, you know, these are, these are um, you know, uh, as I said, you know, just horrendously important aspects of the ocean, horrendously important aspects of, of our, you know, livelihood and sustainability, but I just didn't have time to, to, to do justice to it in here. So with that, I'll, I'll stop, and I do want to thank a whole bunch of people here. It's, it's, it's just some that, that I was able to jot down, but there's, uh, there's many more, and also I do want to thank everybody th for this week. I learned a lot going through the... Uh, all the different uh, meetings, and, and, and it affected the way I presented and thought about things. So um, congratulations to all on a, on a truly, truly wonderful conference, and thank you again for, for the invitation and the chance to be able to, to, to contribute. Thank you. And indeed, thank you to you as well, Cisco, for a very, very inspiring presentation. I think we got time for a couple of questions, if anybody has some questions. Mark, yes, we'll get to you. Yeah. Mark Payne from DTU. Thanks for a great talk, Cisco. It was very exciting to see you highlight the role of seasonal to decadal predictions um, and the role they can play in the next 10 years. What I think we've seen in the last 15 years or so is that we've had the proof of concept that we can do ecological prediction, not just of the physics, but also actually of things that are fishy and, and relevant in the ocean. But the, the real test of a forecast product is not just whether you can go out and do it, but whether somebody actually makes the, a decision based on it. So the real challenge then is how do we ensure that the forecasts that we make are relevant and useful for applications such as in ICES? And how do we take this tool and essentially scale it up from these very specific applications to something where it's used everywhere all the time? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And, um, and, and, and uh, thanks for asking that. It, I, I think, it, if I understood right, I think it'll, t it'll take time to do that. And that's why, you know, when I, I refer to the example of a shadow assessment about how do you take those forecasts and incorporate them in management advice, Actually, these are right now like in an appendix of, of, of the actual, uh, uh, you know, the formal advice that, that's given. Because I think, as I said, we, we, we still need to perhaps, mm, you know, begin to trust even what we're saying. But it, it should be a conversation that's had, um, you know, across the, the science side, if you will, as well as the management side. They should see what we're doing and they should understand the uncertainties that we have and how we're build, building up confidence. But I don't think we should wait too long before doing this. I don't think we should do this in closed doors, to put it that way, or just internally. I think this should be something that is is discussed openly, publicly, and 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 you know, if we get it right, we get it right. If if not, then why not? And how do we grow on it? But I th or how do we build on it? But I think it's 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 imperative that we that we bring this 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 kind of knowledge and and, and application into 
into the into the realm of management consideration. It, it'll make everybody uncomfortable initially, I think even us, um, you know, the, the folks doing the, the, the forecast or the projections, but it's, I think it's a learning process that in the end will result in something that's co-produced rather than just a one-side um, presentation. So thanks for the question. It is, it is Thursday, people got to catch a plane. True. <laughs> or a train, okay. Or a train, enough. or, yeah, Any exactly. other questions, no? Okay. Well, I want to thank Cisco again, and in a very, um, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> and in a very traditional ISIS manner, we thank our speakers with a little gift, just to say thank you so much for a very inspiring presentation, but also for being here once again and supporting the conference Great. and giving us a very nice message for Cisco Thought. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we're now ready to close the conference. I think I will hand you over to Simon Jennings. So please do bear with us and stay here for a little bit longer. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cisco, for an excellent keynote and highlighting the importance of physical and biological linkages. It's an area of work, of course, that brings oceanography and ecology together, and it's so central to something we've always done in ICES, and we're so keen to continue to support. And the first three opening bits in our science plan are about the oceanography leading in as a driver to biological processes, and we're really trying hard to promote engagement again with the oceanographic community to be able to drive forward some of the science of the type that Cisco describes. My name's Simon Jennings, I'm chair of the science committee and I have a strange job of opening the closing of the OC's annual science conference. The first thing I want to do is just thank all of you as participants for being part of this conference in the wonderful city of Gothenburg and for your incredibly active engagement in the many activities taking place throughout the week. It seems to have been a real buzz here, and it's a wonderful thing. The IC's endeavour for us is, in very large part, a bottom-up process. We're not a heavily top-down driven organisation, and we draw on the ideas and innovation taking place in our community, and that's you. And it's wonderful as an event like this to see those ideas and those innovations developing and then we try to gather them and create an environment in which those ideas can be nurtured and developed, form new groups to pursue interesting developments that take place and ultimately to help increase our knowledge of marine ecosystems and to meet uh, societal needs for impartial evidence on the state and sustainable use of the seas which of course is the big IC's overall mission. Your activities at the ASC are always a huge contributor to this and will set the stage for the evolution of our ideas in coming years. But of course, the other amazing thing here is the number of new faces and new people coming into the IC system that are going to drive the future of this organization. And we'll be rewarding some of those people today. So before the president and our hosts formally close this conference, I've got one of the nicest jobs you have as science committee chair, which is giving out money and rewards. And we do this to recognize the best posters and presentations that we've seen at this conference and to thank a number of people who've contributed in different ways to the IC's community. And so without further ado, I'll turn to these awards. The awards we offer are for the best poster by an early career scientist and the best poster overall. And the standard was excellent this year and the lighting and so on in the poster session I think worked absolutely excellently. And then we give three awards for best presentations, two for early career scientists and one for overall. And I should say it's always possible for early career scientists to win the overall awards as well. You'll have seen 
very likely an incredibly hard-working group in action this week. This is our award selection group. They're members of the Science Committee and the Advisory Committee of ICES. The group was chaired there by Niels Olav, and you can see represented many nationalities, and nearly every session you were in was watched by two judges. And I can say, having joined their meeting this afternoon, they've undergone incredibly de careful deliberations to make their decisions about the winners. So turning first to the best posters, the things we, we seek to reward here are posters that are creative, straightforward, and balanced, and combine science with art, integrate the text and figures in a creative way, and present them in an understandable manner. And we like the message of the poster to be readily visible and understandable, and of course, relevant to IC's vision and mission. So the best poster award for an early career scientist, the suspense is killing me, goes to Paulina Atti for her work on ages just a number, the role of senescence in fish population dynamics and life history evolution. And this was a wonderful... <laughs> And I'd like to invite Paulina onto the stage to receive the award. Wonderful. <laughs> and while she makes her way, I'll say this was a wonderful study that looked at how different types of senescence change the maximum size of fishes with a focus on vendace. And it was very beautifully and coherently presented. So well done, Paulina. We'll come across here and we can give you a voucher and a gift. So very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I th maybe, ah, oh, there is someone to photograph. And if you go off stage, there's some other goodies to collect. And if you also wait, I think there's another chance to be photographed without me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The best poster all overall award this goes to someone well known in the ICES community, Pierre Petitgar of France, for his work on the use of. <laughs> satellite image products to understand variation in fish length. And it was a wonderful study that combined information from remote sensing data with understanding of the biology of the anchovy to show that reductions in chlorophyll A since 2010, along with temperature, had led to reductions in size. But the real highlight was a little avatar, so you could ask Pierre questions on his poster, which was well received. And uh, Rudy Vos is here as well, who did that piece of the work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done. So you'll have to share it. There we are. There. And more goodies for you off stage too. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to the Best Presentation Award. And this was incredibly hard to judge this year. I went in to join Neil Solav about an hour ago as they were making the decisions. And it's incredibly difficult to judge across the national and natural and social sciences. It's now a wonderful thing, actually, the diversity of science in ICs but it does make these decisions very, very tough. So these were the top three of a very, very good shortlist of presentations. And we're looking for demonstrations of scientific excellence, creativity, innovation, and leadership in addressing a particular science question in an objective, a clear, and a concise manner. And when the author has an opportunity to respond to questions, we like to see they're able to do that in a very effective way. So the first of the best presentation awards for an early career scientist goes to Leon Green, who's a local from the University of Gothenburg here in Sweden for the study of the effects of reproductive traits on invasions by the brown goby. We don't know if Leon is here. Are you here, Leon, or any of Leon's co-authors? I think not, so we'll pop that one in the bank. It's uh, easy to send.
The second best presentation award for an early career scientist goes to Halle Frolic for a paper on marine aquaculture production under climate change impacts. Halle, would you still be here? Any co-authors would still be here? No, so another one that goes in the bank. But this was a really excellent study looking at, looking at uh, how future climate changes were likely to change aquaculture production based on the life histories of about 180 cultured species. And the authors went on, which we thought was really nice, to look at the implications of that for meeting blue growth targets among ICES countries. So a very relevant and interesting study. We only, I should say, decide these awards at the very last minute. So this is why we can't actually check the authors are still here to present them. So coming on to the best presentation overall. And this award. Yeah. Social scientists love to cheer. I've noticed this. Um, it goes to Amanda Shadeberg for a, an amazing study of uh, fishing behaviour in the Netherlands, showing it wasn't just driven by things like profit and regulation, but driven by a whole lot of other social factors um, that influenced the fishers' decision-making. We thought that was a beautifully presented piece of work. And of course, uh, Amanda is an early career scientist. In fact, she joined us for the early career scientist breakfast on the very first day of the conference. So like last year, it's a clean sweep of the presentation awards again for early career scientists. So very well done, Amanda. <laughs> no, very well done. That's great. That's so strange. <laughs> great. And there's some more goodies for you off stage. OK. <laughs> The final award we wanted to give was an out-of-the-box of award because although it's been a truly wonderful conference, there were one or two tiny hiccups in the provision of power um, during the meeting. And I was told that there was one exceptional session in which a person providing a talk on mapping and vessel monitoring system data, which is quite hard to represent without images, uh, managed to continue. <laughs> uh. And I was told Sigrid gave an amazingly lucid and coherent presentation despite these hiccups. And it was actually quite understandable, even without the maps. So that's a massive achievement. I don't know, Sigrid, if you're there or somewhere. I think it, from Ifram Erin Nant is here who could collect the award on her behalf. Nobody. Another one for the post box then. Ah, Pierre. Yes. There we are, Pierre. You don't get a photograph, though. <laughs> okay. And then finally, in this session of uh, presenting awards, we turn to the service awards. And these are given to recognize achievements of people who've made very substantial contributions to the ICES community during the last few years. And this year, we've got four chairs of strategic initiatives lead it leaving us. These strategic initiatives have helped to drive cross-cutting areas of science within ICES and have had enormous impact, both joining up the work in different expert groups and also projecting ICES science internationally. And first of all, I'd like to recognize the work of Myron Peck, who's an outgoing chair of the ICES Pisces Strategic Initiative on Climate Change Impacts on Marine Ecosystems. And they've been incredibly effective driving a join-up between ICES and Pisces, developing climate change-related work in the Northern Hemisphere, and also making important contributions to IPCC processes. The other chair um, leaving that initiative is John Pinegar, who is here, unlike Myron. And I'd like to invite uh, John to come on the stage and receive the award. Two awards, John, in fact. There we are. Thank you. <laughs> you have to post it. <laughs> Maybe we'll post it for you.
Thanks. Well done. Thank you. And then finally in this session, I'd like to recognise two chairs of the Strategic Initiative on the Human Dimension. You can hear from the um, clapping social scientists in the room that this group have been very, very effective engaging the social sciences in a lot of IC's work in the last few years. They've been instrumental in helping to set up new expert groups on economics and on social science and also in contributing to the development of conferences like the MCs conference and it really has changed the dynamic of a lot of the work taking place. So I'm very grateful to Jorn Schmidt and to Eva Lotta Sundblad who've both served as chairs of this initiative and I believe Jorn's here to collect the award on their behalf. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure to recognize these people. I mean, you all make an enormous contribution to these meetings, but it's always nice to highlight a few exceptional contributions. So can we just uh, give a round of applause for all these people, and then I'll hand over to Jakob Hagberg as representative of our Swedish hosts who've done such a great job running this meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. On a slightly more serious note today than yesterday, um, I am now also speaking for the Swedish government and, um, and first of all I'd like to say that this has really been a very, uh, very, very successful conference. Um, there's been so many interesting seminars, presentations, perfect logistics uh, with food, social events and everything has worked so smoothly and I've only heard only positive uh, comments all over the place uh, for, for the organization of this this conference. So the Swedish government would really like to, to give our sincerest and, and uh, thanks to the Swedish uh, Agency for Marine and Water Management, to all the volunteers and to the ISIS secretariat. So I could, could you please stand up and we can we give them all a, a huge <laughs> thunderous applause. Very well done. Thank you so much for everything you've done. But I'm not done yet. Um, um, the work that is produced by all of you who participate here at ISIS um, is really the basis for our, our common understanding of, of many of the aspects that we know of the marine management um, uh, and this is really important. Uh, it, it is this really common understanding that of the problems that, that makes it possible for our governments to, to agree on management measures in our part of the world. Uh, and we cannot take this for granted, really. This is definitely not uh, what it's like in, in most parts of the world. And it's quite unique, actually, that, that our government really managed to, to agree on, on so many measures. Um, and this conference is really a part, a part of this, this formation of, of networks, understanding of how it works in our neighbor countries, um, and to develop common solutions that we all agree on that, that can be implemented in our seas. Um, so, so therefore, it's really important that all we member, member countries of ICES um, make an effort to make sure that uh, the annual sciences conference continue year after year. Um, lastly, I would like to say that I think for all of us who's been involved, 
It's been a, a huge pleasure and an honor to host the annual science conference for Sweden. And we, we would finally just like to, to thank all of you who have participated uh, with presentations and, and discussions and everything for, for, for coming here. And uh, I hope I'll see you soon again. Thank you. And now I think I'm going to leave to over to Fritz directly, is it? Yeah, thank you, Jakob. It is, is really not easy to uh, close the conference, I must admit. It's a little bit remembering me in earlier times when being to a conference where I thought, is this actually an environment one would like to conserve, to continue. Um, but I guess we can agree, all of us, that this annual science conference was an excellent experience. It was both interesting, inspiring, and, and joyful, and very well executed. I guess that is really fair to say. Could stop here, but I mean, somebody needs also to, uh, for example, thank Jakob. I will do that. The program was characterized by a lively opening session. We had outstanding keynotes and a variety of interesting and also complementing theme sessions. And I, what, what I really think I like very much is it is starting to fill the new strategic plan, especially the science plan. You can really see that it is mapping out. So I think that's really positive. The science presented gave a good overview on state and progress in understanding of the marine ecosystem. For example, in the session on oceanography and ecosystems in the North Atlantic. Several of the sessions addressed effects of human activities. An example was the session on assessing ecosystem vulnerability to uh, multiple drivers and pressures. Results of experimental field and modeling work were used often in conjunction, and specific methodological aspects of importance were addressed, for example, machine learning, we have talked about that, but also other ones which are important for the science we are doing. Quite some of the presented work targeted enhanced understanding and evidence to support integrated ecosystem assessments and ecosystem-based management in general, which fits also perfectly well to the science plan. This includes, increasingly, the coverage of human drivers and social economic aspects. We have been in there. That is an area, or these are areas which are traditionally not really key areas of ISIS, but I think the development is really positive in that as well. And it is needed. It is needed for the understanding of the system dynamic as well as to anticipate future advisory needs. In the global context, the food security and the climate change aspects were addressed, especially by our keynotes, but not only. It was going across our theme sessions. And I think that's important because the larger aspects of spatial scale is important for an understanding of what is ongoing in the Earth system, across ecosystem, and the consequences for smaller scales, downscaling them is important as well. In all of this, more traditional areas such as fishery science or aquaculture were not completely forgotten. There were sessions directly addressed to them as well. We had a good and generously spaced poster session and that functioned really very well as a um, point for discussion, a central forum. Basically, that was what it was. We had interesting complementing network sessions and events using different forms and mechanisms of interactions and communication. And I, as far as I was able to participate, found them really inspiring, both in form and content. And in this respect, I would also like to highlight the early career activities with and for early career scientists. So, like before, I would like really thank 
you, you all, for participating in the conference and your engagement, which was visible all throughout, I would say. Having said that, I would like to compliment, really, for the execution of the conference in this lovely conference center. And that includes excellent planning and really getting it through. So in that respect, I would like to, on behalf of ISIS, and I hope I am able, that is interesting, not really. We try it the other way around. I think I will do it without a slide. <laughs> Probably the first labs we have, a part of from the cow uh, power supply cut. I would like to thank the government offices of Sweden. So I'm starting relatively high up. But then next, the Swedish delegates, Karin Victorin and Jakob Hasbeck. The Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, with Jakob Granit as Director General and the Steering Committee and uh, Anna Jörbjörn and Thomas Klein, including the conference coordination team. Maria Zetterquist, Emma Sandland, Dorte Hopen and Pernilla Johansson. And I would like to ask all of them to come on stage. It is not so that I've forgotten Anna and Vera from the ISIS um, Secretariat. That comes to later. I would like really to thank for the organization and for an excellent conference. <laughs> and I think the traditional ISIS gifts are waiting over there. I think when going down, you are simply passing there. Thank you very much. You. My thanks to you are actually extending also to the social events, not only to the conference as such. They were entertaining and well organized. And I guess Jakob and Karin have actually set a new standard to the involvement of ISIS delegates in the conference, which will not be easy to meet. But also the rest of the team was really great. For example, not least Thomas as master of ceremony. I found him really astonishing. I would like to extend my gratitude also to the team of Gautier Towers and Svenska Messen for providing a beautiful and well-functioning frame for the conference. Give them a hand. And last but not least, a uh, big thanks also to the ISIS Secretariat, especially Anna and Vera, for their effort, professionality, <laughs> and friendliness. <laughs> Finally, I wish you all a good and safe journey home, and hope to see you all again in 2020, where we will held the conference in Copenhagen. And I guess we will have also a small video on that for those who don't know Copenhagen. Thank you very much for the conference. It was a pleasure.